I want to see a flamingo. I mean, if that was in the planning, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thank y'all. That's awesome. Somebody's going to come up with one now, aren't they? How many of y'all have a flamingo in your yard? Be honest. This is Indiana, right? Borderline Kentucky. How many of you have a flamingo in your yard? You have one? Do you really? That's awesome. I love it. I love it. We actually have had flamingos in our yard before. Uh, and I'm proud of that fact that we've had flamingos in our yard. And if I had one now, I would put it right here on the front pew. So it's good to be together. Are you guys awake? Yes. No, no. Hey, I want to tell you something. Alan mentioned to you that I have the Kyle Publication booth set up. And uh, he mentioned a little bit about what we do. Back in the end of August, I transitioned into full-time work where I travel the country now, and that's what I get to do full-time. Uh, so I'm at a different location every weekend pretty much, and you all are the last stop in the year for me. That's a great thing. Uh, God has been good to us through this, and uh, he has kept us very, very busy. We've been so busy, we sold our house back in September, and we didn't even buy a new one. We don't even own a house. We don't rent an apartment. We don't rent a house. We literally move from hotel to hotel, and when we're not in a hotel, then we're stopping in at my mother's house in Gainesboro. My father died in December, so she has a big house, and so that's kind of where we're at, but all of our stuff's in storage, so this is what we do full time. So to see these planning videos, and to be the guy that you guys wanted to come in, again, I thank you for that. That's a big deal to me. I told Mr. Allen last night, it's one thing when adults line up a speaker and then they tell the kids, this is who's coming. It's another thing when the kids could have selected anybody that the, obviously the elders would have approved and you guys selected me. So thank you for that. I'm honored to be with you. I do want to let you know that at Kyle Publications, we do have a booth out there with product. All the prices are on the back. I would give it all away if I could, but then Kyle would not exist. Uh, and so that's just the nature of the beast. But if you have any questions about it, let me know. But one thing I do want to let you know about, and since everybody said they had a phone last night, including Peyton, where's Peyton? Peyton, you're still here. Have you come up with any reasons why Apple is better than Android? It's more updated version of what? Of Androids. So Apple's the setting the pace. Is that what you're saying? All right. I went looking for you last night. I understood you had some reasons. So I appreciate you coming back with some reasons. But I want to show you this. Since the majority of you said you had uh, a phone, right? Raise your hand if you have a phone again, just so I know. I don't care if it's Android or Apple or not. Now, lower your hand. Raise your hand if you have a flip phone. That's all I really care about this morning. No flip phones. I was waiting on an adult to raise their hand with pride to say they had a flip phone, right? I honestly would go back to a flip phone. I have no problems with flip phones because these smartphones take away too much time. Uh, however, if I did that, then my gameplay would be very limited and my video watching would be very limited. But I am borderline considering the Motorola where they're bringing back the Razer where it's a smartphone but the screen bends. Have you seen that? That is crazy. If you'd have told me that back when the razor was first brought out, I would have said, you, there's no way you can make a screen that bends and still works. So that would be kind of neat to see. But what I want to show you is a free thing. Since you have a phone, I want to show you something that Kyle Publications makes absolutely free, regardless if you're on the Google Play Store, you're an Android user, or you're an Apple or out of the Apple Store. It is a free 40-page magazine, e-zine actually, that we publish, and that it is made free because congregations throughout the country have gotten on board to support it, so teenagers don't have to pay for it, which is awesome. Uh, but here's what I want you to do. Those of you who have phones, I want you to take your phone out right now, if you don't mind. Go ahead, take your phone out, open up your app store, and don't act like you don't know how to open the app store. I know you do, right? Open the app store. And what I want you to type in is I want you to type in a lowercase i, and then I want you to type in an uppercase L, and then I want you, this is all the rest of it's lowercase, U-M-I-N-A-T-E, and then I want you to put a space, and then I want you to type magazine, okay? Now what you'll see on that is a, uh, an icon that looks much like this at the very top. Does anybody see that? A red box with a flame. Go ahead, if your parent, I mean download it. I know my kids have smartphones, but I've said it where I have to approve all their downloads. So if you can download it, go ahead, download it, request a download. And what you're going to see is this. You're going to see 
that all of these issues are going to immediately be sent to your phone because that app gives you every issue of the magazine that has ever been published. Yes. Yes, I can. Lowercase i, uppercase L, capital L, and then the rest of this is lowercase. U, M, I, N, A, T, E, space, and then the word magazine. Now download that. Here's what happens with this. What I showed you was the latest edition with the Stormtrooper on the front. We interviewed a guy named Alan Grimes, who's your brother in Christ. He has a contract with Upper Deck Cards and Top Trading Cards to draw all of their Star Wars stuff and their Stranger Things stuff. He's out of Florida. He's your brother in Christ, and he is an artist that's been able to break out of what I would say are within the church works, and he's using that, that talent and skill in the secular world, setting a great godly example. Uh, anyhow, within this magazine, that's why I have a picture on the front that he drew, but this issue, it's all interactive, and of course, if you have a tablet, it's a whole lot easier to see, which is why I show it on this one, but when I say it's interactive, that means this, if you want to go to that article, you click that page, you click that article, and then you hit the jump to page 41 concept, and what will happen is, it will actually jump there if I'm hitting it correct. Maybe if I have the actual, there it is. I was checking my internet connection. And so it'll jump from article to article. If it says click here, you can click there. Uh, instead of including an editor's page that's written, we record a video. And so we are able to embed videos in the magazine. Uh, every time one is published, it'll be sent to your phone. You can flip back through it, see who we've interviewed, the cool things that we've done. And of course, this started back when I was at another company as the, the director of youth and culture. And I served as the founder and the editor of what was called Kyo Magazine. Uh, from there, we started Kyle Publications, and that's when we came out with Illuminate Magazine. So I wanted you to see that because I don't want you to say, man, we went to a youth rally and they didn't give us anything. All they want to do is buy stuff. No, I, get, I have just given you something, a free subscription to a teenage magazine if you choose to use it, okay? And so you can flip through those issues. And uh, of course, we're trying to update it more regularly with the changing of the job. It's been a little bit more difficult. Uh, however, the next issue that I have ready to go and is uh, going to be on the idea of transformation and recovery, where we've interviewed members of the church who've come out of drug addiction, who've come out of alcohol addiction, who've come out of pornography addiction, uh, and they are faithful Christians today. And at the center of that, I'm still trying to deal with the center of that magazine because I want the center to be something pretty cool is I want it to be some very high profile individuals that lived a life of sin. I mean, we're talking, I don't want to classify sin, but we're talking sin, right? Capital S, capital I, capital N. And yet, according to the records that we know of, they were baptized for the remission of their sins, and they're your brothers in Christ. The two individuals that I'm trying to, to verify, and one of them is verified, but it would make your, you probably would look at that and go, what? One of them is Jeffrey Dahmer. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer used to eat people. Yet when he was in prison, he wrote to Phil Sanders. I don't know if you know Phil Sanders. He does In Search of the Lord's Way. He wrote to Phil Sanders' uncle. Phil Sanders, I say he wrote to him. Phil Sanders' uncle wrote to him, who's a minister, and they began a Bible study. And before Jeffrey Dahmer was killed in prison, he was baptized for the remission of his sins. Now, I know that we look at sins and we're like, there's no way God can forgive that. God could forgive Saul, who used to drag people off to prison and beat them, and he held the coats of people who stoned Stephen to death. The other guy that I'm trying to justify is called Devil Ains Hatfield. You ever heard of the Hatfields and the McCoys? Devil Ains Hatfield was the leader of the Hatfield portion of that. And I'm trying to research, and I've got some family. You got something? Boom! good, you can tell me everything I need to know. I know, I was going to say, I've met a lot of the Hatfields and talked to a lot of the Hatfields, and everything that I have discovered was, you don't know who the Hatfields and the McCoys were. The Hatfields and the McCoys were the greatest, I guess you would say, family rivalry 
that you and I have ever thought about existing in America today, they'll even tell you it's the Hatfields and the McCoys all over again, right? It's kind of like uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Those names are notorious with a man and a woman on a crime spree. Hatfields and the McCoys are very notorious. Anyhow, Devil Lane's Hatfield, at the end of his life, after, uh, after issuing commands to, to kill people in that whole thing, the uh, story records that he was baptized for the remission of his sins and that he established actually a congregation of the Lord's church. But I've got to verify that. Uh, so anyhow, that's kind of the stuff that comes out in this magazine, some cool things like that. And so that's the next issue that I'm working on. Yeah, but if you have any information, man, don't hesitate to let me know, okay? That'd be awesome. There you go. So there's my, my two-second plug for, you're like, two seconds? You don't know how to count time. I know, I'm a preacher, Okay. Anyhow, let's go to our Father in prayer, and we're going to get right into this topic today because uh, we're talking about a funnel, and we're talking about our discernment, and we're talking about how can we do this better. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to call you Father. And Lord, we pray today that as we approach learning, we approach having fun with each other, we approach our Bible classes, the times of praise and singing. Lord, we pray that we would give you our heart in this, that we not, we not merely go through the motions. Lord, you, you don't accept uh, motion worship just for the sake of going through it. And Lord, we pray that we, we don't have that. We pray that there's some authenticity, that, that there's meaning. And I pray, Lord, that as we go through this day, you would help us to push aside what Satan would love to put in our way to distract and to to deter us, and that we would give you this day, Lord. Thank you for your son. Thank you for giving us your all. Thank you for redeeming us. And I pray that we never cheapen the gift that you have given us, the gift of salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, last night I introduced something to you, and I brought it today because I was like, there's no way I'm putting the slide back up, so I want you to to see this. What did I tell you last night the funnel represents? Somebody tell me, what? I had it on the screen, there were words out beside it. What did I tell you it represented? Processing information, your ability to discern, right? That's the idea that you're trying to tell right from wrong. Now, in that same illustration, though, I showed you some balls, some look like ping pong balls and things like that. These represented the information that is out there. The word that I had on the screen was the word options, right? I'm not even going to ask you because I don't want to kind of stall. You would be the only one that would answer, so we're good anyway. Actually, you remember this. You remember this. The idea of the options that you have, right? And the way this works is you can't control all of this because this information exists because there's plenty of people to give you their opinion. There's plenty of people to tell you their conclusions. But what happens is in this process of learning to discern, you take all that information and you put it into your filter, your funnel, And at the end of the day, and of course you and I both know that one of those balls is not coming out that little bitty hole, right? So it's all stuck in there. But at the end of the day, it's this. You gather the information, and through the process of discernment, there is an action or a belief that is a result. Now that action and belief is critical to your salvation, It's critical to the way that you interact with people in this world. It's critical to your concept of family. It's critical to your concept of worship. Because there are plenty of people that will tell you that there are options that exist in the world as it pertains to family, as it pertains to uh, religion, as it pertains to worship styles, as it pertains to many things. And what happens is you gather stuff and you process it so that you can come up with an action or a belief. And I told you last night as we began that there are a couple things that are pivotal, and we only were able to address one for the sake of time, but I told you something that is pivotal to your ability to discern is your starting point or your worldview. And so we looked at the idea, there were five options that most most people fall into those five categories, but the two in America that most people fall into is either naturalism or theism. In other words, it is the creation versus evolution issue. Now, we didn't explore all of that. That was outside of the realm of that lesson. I merely wanted to introduce to you a concept, and that concept was your worldview matters. Because the, the starting point dictates the ending point. 
And so you've got to make sure your worldview, and of course I highly would encourage you if I had the opportunity to go into de to depth, I would talk about reasons why we can believe God exists, reasons why we, we can know that the Bible is trustworthy, reasons why we know that Jesus literally walked on the earth, he literally died on the cross, and his tomb is literally empty uh, as the Son of God, as he claimed that he was and that he is. All of that plays into my worldview, but there's something else I want to talk to you about today that also plays into your worldview. And that is because, as I mentioned to you, there is going to be no shortage of options. There will be no shortage of options in your life. In other words, you're going to have people tell you uh, about how to live family is something that I've mentioned have individuals tell you things along the lines of uh, different color of skin of people and how to treat them and how to expect to be treated by them. You're going to have people tell you no problem whatsoever what political party that you should be a part of and why. And there are going to be other people that will tell you things like this, where should you go to church? What kind of worship style should you have? All of those options are going to be very plentiful. Now, on top of all of those, though, there are some thought processes that actually play into your ability to discern those options that went into the top so that you can come up with an action or a belief at the bottom. And some of those belief systems maybe seem like they're neutral because at times you don't understand all, all about them. One of those would be like feminism. Right? You could go forever on feminism. Some of you have heard that word before, but you're not real sure what that means unless it means just a woman who's standing up for, for equality or a woman who's standing up for herself. That's oftentimes the way that we describe feminism. And, and within that discussion, we talk about how mean men have been over the years, and therefore they're, they're reaping what they sow, and we're glad that there's, there's a, a putting down of one and an elevating of another because in order to have equality, then we've got got to make this right. Uh, you may not know that we're on the fourth wave of feminism in America. Four waves. In other words, like oceans have waves that crash on the shore, there have been waves that have crashed over and over again, and some of those have been very good. In other words, things like this, do I believe women should have a right to vote? Absolutely I do. Absolutely I do. That was a result of one of the ways of feminism. I believe that women should be able to own land. You know, there was a time in America that if you belonged to a farmer and he had land and he and his wife died, or actually he died because the land couldn't belong to his wife, and you were a daughter, you were the only one that was in his family, you could not inherit the land. It had to go to the next closest living relative that was a male. So in other words, even though you worked the land, you lived on the land, it was your daddy who owned the land, you could not inherit the land. Do I believe that women should be able to own land that was in their family or land that they purchase? Absolutely I do. So are there some good things that have come out of feminism? Some of those, but I will tell you this, today feminism has kind of become a catch-all term where we talk about gender equality. And the reason we use feminism and, and the umbrella of feminism to talk about gender equality is because we don't even want to talk about genders in our culture today, which is another thought process of, of destroying the concept of genders. In other words, don't call me a he, don't call me a she, call me a, uh, an, not even an it, right? A Z, call me an XE, or call me a ZE. Right? It's interesting. I've seen articles today where people are saying that they're not having babies, they're having thabies. Yeah, because if you say a baby, there's a tendency maybe to assign a gender to that. But if you say a thaby, then that thaby gets to decide their gender as they grow. I could show you National Geographic articles of individuals who believe that they should raise their children without influencing the gender choice that they have. So there are people, for the first time in 125 years, the National Geographic put on its cover a nine-year-old boy who is being raised that the boy can just choose whatever the boy wants to be. And at this particular moment, he was dressing up as a girl. I could show you pictures of YouTube stars, influencers, who uh, were on the cover of, of uh, makeup magazines. James Charles comes to mind. An individual who you would think, there's no way. Yeah, there's a way he's making a lot of money putting on makeup in the they be category, in the genderless category. 
Feminism today is an umbrella to mask the sexual identity concept, but I would offer this to you. Ultimately, feminism falls apart at its foundation because the core is this, equality for all, regardless if you're a man or a woman. Well, in our culture today, that's a taboo subject to even talk about being a man or a woman, but I would offer this to you. I have no problem with a woman getting the same pay as a man. That's not the issue. I, I believe if a person is qualified and the person works for what they, they agreed to work for, then they should be paid what they agreed to work for. My issue is this. If you really believe you're worth $20 an hour, then don't go in and take the job for $13 an hour. Go in and take the job for 20 and if they don't offer you 20 don't take the job. But if you took the job for 13, don't whine because you're a male or a female that they're only paying you 13. That's what you agreed to. So in other words, don't take the job. Get something else. But here's why I tell you feminism at its core falls apart because at the core it's about gender equality. And I will tell you this, in America we do not want gender equality. We, do, we really don't. And here's why. It's one of the hot button topics that are being discussed amongst culture watchers. At the age of 18, how many of you guys are 18 or above in here? Raise your hand, you men. The age of 18, every one of you guys had to do something or you will have to do something. What do you have to do at the age of 18? Tell me. You had to sign up to be drafted. Every man in this room has had to sign up to be drafted at the age of 18. Alan, I'm not sure if they could draft us, brother. I think we might be a little over the hill in that draft category, but I'm not real sure if it came to push comes to shove, right? But you know how many of you 18-year-old girls? Raise your hand if you're 18-year-old girl. Or there you go, you're a, hey, okay. Guess how many 18 year old girls have to register for the draft? Zero. It's one of the next talking subjects that's going on right now, those who are culture watchers, that we're saying if we really want gender equality, then every single one of you young ladies, when you turn 18, you better go register to be drafted, to stand on the front lines, to carry a machine gun, to be shot at. You see, the reality is there are some young ladies that are like, yeah, but we let ladies apply for special forces and they can, they can be, yeah, but that's free will offering, right? That's your choice. If there comes to a point in time in a draft, 18-year-old boys, excuse me, men, they wouldn't get a choice. You just go when your number is called. The reality is that makes us uncomfortable when we start talking about drafting 18-year-old girls because that's not the culture that we're ready for. But that's why I tell you, we're really not interested in, in gender equality, which is why I tell you, feminism at its core falls apart when you get down to the really the, the basis of, of gender equality. Other concepts, though, that influence your discernment would be things like atheism. I'm not going to go into depth on that, but atheism is the absolute assurance that God does not exist. And it's a belief pattern that lives and, and filters through every other concept. If God doesn't exist, then there is no moral standard. And if there is no moral standard, then you can live any way you want. Right? Other concepts that, that spill out of atheism would be things like humanism. Humanism is what I mentioned last night. God doesn't sit on the throne. Man sits on the throne. And so therefore, if man sits on the throne, who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? And who are you to tell me that I can't do what I want to do? Basically, what we say is this. The only limitations that you have in this life are at the point in time that your rights come into conflict with another person's rights. So therefore, as long as it doesn't come into conflict with another person's rights and you want to do it, then so be it. Do it. So the way that our culture says it is this, however many partners you want before you get married, do it because it's, it's up to your liking. You want to kill the baby before the baby is born, do it. It's your body. I mean, those are the talking points of humanism. And you can see how it infiltrates our system, how it infiltrates even at times our education system. And we talk, start talking about philosophy and things along those lines. Other concepts, when you really start thinking about this belief system, are, are concepts that you may not find that are, are serious, but another one is one that I want to talk to you about this morning for the time that we have, and it's the concept of denominationalism. And you would say it's a belief, it's a theory, it's a, it's a, it's a talking point, and I would say yes it is, because in the society that we live in, we live in a very, what's called a pluralistic society. Pluralism is the concept of there are many ways... Uh, a, plur a plurality, multiple ways to accomplish what you claim is the same end. And so our argument that we have today is this. It doesn't matter if you go down this path, this path, this path, this path. As long as it leads to the same destination, who cares of the pathway that you take? 
Now that was not just touted in our culture today. That was actually touted by an individual who is an influencer because of TV and because of magazines and because of her, her prominence in, in public life. That was an individual who was named Oprah Winfrey who would actually tout that belief system. But she didn't tout that belief system just as it pertained to are you a Catholic, are you a Baptist, are you a Presbyterian, are you a Methodist, are you Episcopalian? And if you'll allow me to use this term in the same discussion, are you a Church of Christer, which I hate that concept, right? But that's the way our world looks at it is. It's all in the same concept of there's this path, there's this path, there's this path, there's this path. Oprah Winfrey took the approach of who cares if an individual is in a new age concept and worships the crystal and believes the crystal has healing power and the light is kind of this enlightenment thing that you, you actually are elevated in your understanding and you become higher than humanity. Uh, who cares if a person follows that route versus if a person follows what she would call Judeo-Christian values? As she would say, as long as it ends up at the same place, who cares what they called it along the way? Well, our culture has taken that view. That's why when you look at this, this picture, it really is an accurate description even of communities like this one and the community of which you come from and the community of which I come from. You drive down the street and you pass religious building after religious building with names on the sign and people who say, hey, as long as you say Jesus, we're good, we worship a little different, we do things a little different, we have some belief systems different, but who really cares as long as, as, long as we're all heading in the same direction? Well, that is a belief system called denominationalism. Denominationalism says this, who cares how many denominators there are Right? Denominators, they are not of the original. That's how it's called a denomination. It's not of the original. Who cares how many of those there are? Who cares if there's variation in worship? Who cares if there's variation in belief systems on salvation? As long as it ends up at the same point, who cares? That's denominationalism. Now in America today, there are thousands of denominations. That's the way our world talks about them thousands of them. And if you believe that it's just as simple as saying, well, there's the Methodist church, there's the Baptist church, there's Presbyterian church, the Episcopalian, you're wrong in that because there are multiple divisions even within those religious organizations. You, know, you would have the first Baptist church, you would have the first free will Baptist church, you would have the primitive Baptist church, you would have the Southern Baptist church, and those are not all the same. Now, I need you to hear me say this. This lesson today is not about people in those religious groups. You hear me say that? This is not about people in those groups. This is about a thought process. People in those groups, I've got good friends that do not agree with me and that are in different religious groups. It's not about people. It's about belief systems. Okay? It's not even the variation of what the Methodists believe versus the Catholics. It's the belief system of denominationalism that who cares what path you take along the way. Well, I want to show you two models. And through this process of learning to discern and the idea of, of thoughts and belief systems that derail our discernment, I want to show you two models. The first model is very much so kind of, I guess you would say, what, what many in this room would attest to. And that is this, the Bible would teach that there is the church. And then what the, the world around us shows is that there are a lot of religious groups that have church buildings and will gather and they will worship according to their styles and according to their belief patterns. However, that there is a, a veering away from the church. So in other words, there's the church and then there's all these other belief systems. That's model number one. Model number two looks very different. And I want you to see if you can tell the difference between model number one and model number two. Model number one says there's the church and then there's all the circles outside of the church. Model number two says there's the church and then there's a bunch of circles within the church. That would be the idea of this. Look, there's the big church, and like the church universal, and then there's sub-segments of the church all within the church. 
but we're all the church is model number two. Now, you look at that, and obviously the question comes about is this. When I look at model number one, I have to ask myself, is that model fitting with the Bible and what the Bible says? Because as I come to my ability to discern, I've got to discern things according to the Word of God if I'm going to be a follower of God. If I'm not interested in being a follower of God, then I'll just throw the Bible away and I'll be in the category of humanism. Even if I'm not in the category of atheism, I'll be in the category of humanism which says, I'm not going to let God sit on the throne. I admit there is a God, but he's not going to sit on the throne when it comes to the subject of what we're talking about, denominationalism. Or the idea is this, I have to look at model number one, and then I have to look at model number two, and I have to say, does model number two fit according to the Bible? If model number two fits according to the Bible, then you know what? I'm going to let God be the one that decides what the church is. And I'm not going to put on God what the church is, but I've got to weigh that because if I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then I've got to let God determine this. Otherwise, I'm going to kick God off the throne. I'm going to sit on the throne and I'm going to come to conclusions that I want to come to because at the end of the day, I'm not really interested in what he wants. I'm only interested in what I want. Or through my discernment process... As I take in all the options, the question is, do I want actions and beliefs that actually line up with God? That's my discernment funnel. The Word of God helps me in this discernment and actually is the discerning factor when it comes to right and wrong. So the idea is this, if model number one's right, then model number two can't be right. And if model number two is right, then model number one can't be right. The idea is this, this isn't a both and concept. Both of these models are not the same because both of them aren't saying the same thing. There's some laws of thought within logic and I know some of you have taken logic. If you haven't, you will. You will learn of things like the law of non-contradiction. You will learn of things like the law of, of excluded middles. The law of excluded middle says this, when two statements are made in opposition of one another at the same time, that there's this concept that the middle ground, the gray area, does not exist, right? That's the idea. That would look like this. If somebody comes in and says this building exists and somebody else says this building does not exist, logic tells you there is no middle ground in that because the building either exists or it doesn't and if it exists by default the other argument is wrong if it doesn't exist by default the other argument is wrong that's excluded middle law of non-contradiction says something very similar to that two statements that are made in opposition of one another at the same time about the same entity both cannot be right unless of course you're dealing with subjectivity And that's a whole other discussion of are we dealing with objectivity or subjectivity? Are we we concerned with objective truth or are we concerned with subjective truth? You've heard me say this before, some of you. If you haven't, subjective truth is like this. Two people go in to see the same movie and they come out and one of them says that was the worst movie I've ever seen. The other person comes out and says that was the best movie I've ever seen. Can both of those people be right? Shake your head like this because it's based on subjectivity. Right? But objectivity is the same illustration. This building exists, this building does not exist. It's not based upon my opinion, it's based upon reality. That's an objective standard. Does this podium exist or does this podium not exist? Is not based upon, well, today I feel, today I think, or back in my history I was really hurt by somebody, so now this podium doesn't exist. No, either the podium exists or it doesn't. But if they want to talk about subjectivity, then we can do that. But this model, this concept here, it's not based in the subjectivity. It's based in the objectivity. So the question then lies with this. When I start looking at a biblical pattern, which model is correct? Model number one or model number two? So what I want you to do is I want you to get your Bibles out. I know you have them. You just got your phones out, right? And I want us to start flipping through some of these and read these out loud because it is important that we not just say we know what we know, but we actually see that we know what we know. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 is a very common passage in dealing with this concept of which model is correct. 
The Bible says, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, I also say to you, now this is when Peter was confessing Jesus, right? You've heard, you've read this before. Peter was confessing Jesus, and up in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, which you need to be very careful, there's different words for Peter and rock in this. There's a rock like a little pebble, uh, that's Peter, and then there's a big boulder that's the rock that Jesus is saying, and upon this rock, it's a different word than the word Peter. Uh, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, what's beautiful about this passage, it says this, I will build my church, and within my church, you will find many different churches within my church. Does your Bible say that? Does your Bible say that? Mine doesn't either. How many churches does it say that was built here? How many? One. It says there was one, right? It says there was one. We need to be real with this. Turn over, you will, of Acts chapter 2, verse 47. I want you to see this. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. The Bible talks about those who were being added on the day of Pentecost if they were obeying the gospel. That's how an individual is added, added to the family of God. But I want you to see those who uh, were added, what they were added to, Right? Now, when I look at this, I've got to go back up to, let's see here, uh, let's go up to uh, the concept of, of Acts chapter 2, verse 37. The Bible says this, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of, sin, of your sins. That's the purpose for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. You drop down to verse 47. It says that they went about praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now I want you to picture this. I want you to picture the day of Pentecost, right? There is, no, uh, there is nothing that's happened like this before, and I want you to be a TV reporter with me, right? I want you to imagine this. There's this long line. People are waiting to go into the the, the water to be baptized, and you're a reporter, and you're reporting on the news. Yes, this is Joe Wells with Action News 2. We're standing here on the day of Pentecost, and there is something that is taking place that, that has brought an enormous crowd today, and we want to we want to interview some of these people. Uh, look, here comes someone now. You can tell they've, they've just been baptized. They're soaking wet. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, what is this that's going on today? Well, we're, we're here today in response to the gospel, and, and it was pretty preached by the apostles, and we believed that Jesus is the Son of God, and we wanted to have our sins forgiven, so we were baptized. So, so all of these people, all of these people that are lined up, they're believe, they believe the same thing. Yes, all of these people here on the, on the day of Pentecost, uh, we heard the message, the same message, and, and, and the reality was this. We were, we were pierced to our heart with the message of that gospel, and, and when we asked, we asked them what we needed to do to be saved, they said that we needed to be fully immersed, baptized uh, for, the, for the purpose of the forgiveness of our sins, for the remission of our sins. So, so you all are coming out of something and, and into this belief system. Uh, yes, we're coming, um, most people here, we're coming out of Judaism. Uh, you're coming out of Judaism. Do you understand the consequences of that? Yes, we understand, but when we're convicted that this is right, we've got to come out of this. Oh, you, okay, so, so let me get this straight. All of you are leaving something, you're coming into something else called Christianity, and you're doing the same thing and being saved in the same way by being baptized for the mission of your sins. Yes, that, that would be right. Okay, sir, I only have one other question. Uh, can you tell me which denomination do you belong to? What, what, do, you, what do you mean? You don't understand, sir. Um, in the world... In America, what's, what's America? In, in America, we've got different, different groups like Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, uh, Episcopal. Uh, we, we've got the, the Church of Christers, you know. So you're telling me that where you come from, 
that there are people who believe different things and that you're saved by different ways and they worship. Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. So my only question is this, uh, which denomination do you belong to? What do you think they would say on the day of Pentecost? They would say this, we don't understand denomination. All we know is we responded to the gospel and they told us according to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because these dudes spoke in, in tongues that they hadn't studied and we heard them in our own languages that we needed to be baptized for the remission of our sins and that we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord in that event that he's the Lord of our life and, and we want to be his disciples. That's what we know. So when they were asked what denomination do they belong to? They would have said, what are you talking about? You know why they would have said that? Because there were no denominations on the day of Pentecost. There was only the church. And that's who God was adding to their number. That's why when you comb through the text, you look at passages like Ephesians chapter 1, uh, and you see the idea of the uniqueness of the body of Christ that it's spoken of in a singular nature. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 20. 22 and following, and he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You go over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, you'll find out there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. You come through the scriptures, and you know what you're going to find is you're going to find a concept that in the early days of the establishment of the church, there were no divisions like we have today in America. Now, there would arise those divisions later on, but I got to tell you something. When we look at the scriptures, division is not something that the Bible was like, you know what, that sounds like a good idea. I know we're going to have people that believe different things about salvation. We're going to have people that believe different things about worship styles. We're going to have people that believe that, that some people should not be married and that they should wear black coats with white collars. Or maybe that there should be women that should never be married and they should wear long black dresses and live in, in isolation. You know, we know those are things are going to be okay. So how about this? We're just okay with whatever you come up with. That would have been a totally foreign concept to the early church. That's a foreign concept to God's word. That's why when you and I comb through the pages here, what we learn is this, that the denominationalism belief system that exists in America is in absolute conflict with the word of God. That's why they're warned of division. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, this is where Paul's writing to the elders at Ephesus. And he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Why did they need to be on guard? Because there were going to be people that would arise that would try to divide them. Or 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who, brought, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon them. Why would he warn of false teachers if false teachers would not pull people away? You look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, and this is a passage where, where Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, and he says this, verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you to, by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Other passages will bluntly say some of the things that I've just said. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. You know, it's possible to fall away. Here's how they fall away. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That doesn't mean they become devil worshipers. When you read 1 Timothy, you'll find out that the doctrines of demons are those individuals they're teaching if it contradicts the simple message of the gospel. But you don't hear that today. Can you imagine how, how unpolitically correct that would be today? To go out and say that individuals who have fallen into denominationalism, people who do not teach the truth of God's word, that they are teaching doctrines of demons. Boy, you talk about people shunning you. 
Well, you just think you know everything, don't you? You think you got it figured out. Whoa, you're being judgmental. That was pretty harsh. Well, what you find out is this. Paul didn't have any problems calling it what it was. He said it's doctrines of demons. By means, this is how, verse 2, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Now here's what's interesting. There are religious holidays today that certain groups participate in that they have to abstain from certain foods. There are religions that believe that people should not be allowed to marry or that they should forbid marriage in some extents. And you look at all of that and you say, but Joe, does it really matter? And I would offer this to you. Oh, it matters. It matters because when it comes to discernment, when it comes to this concept of understanding the difference between right and wrong, it matters because you take in a lot of information and if you process it, through the world's teachings, then you're not going to get an action or a belief that lines up with what God would have you to do. That's why when you look at Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13, and we're, we don't have the time to, to flush this out completely, but what I want you to do is I want you to look over at the very end because this is talking about the traditions of men. They're eating with unwashed hands and things along those lines. And I want you to look down at verse 13. Actually, I want you to look at verse 10 and following, Mark chapter 7, uh, verses 10 and following, when the Bible says, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of a father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or his mother, Whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God. In other words, I can't help you, mom and dad, because this belongs to God. Verse 12, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. In other words, these people are saying, you, you're actually hindering one generation taking care of an older generation by allowing this to be, and that's not right. Verse 13, thus in doing so, you invalidate the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down and you do many things such as that. You know what's interesting is traditions are not horrible. We've got a holiday coming up soon called Thanksgiving, right? And we have traditions, you have traditions. Some of you are going to eat turkey at your holiday, at your Thanksgiving. Some of you, your family doesn't eat turkey. Maybe you're going to eat steak. Maybe you're going to eat ham. Maybe you're going to eat turducken or whatever it's called, right? <laughs> the idea of a turkey and a duck mixed, right? But you have holiday traditions, there may be a certain, uh, a certain thing that is served at the table that is special to grandma, right? And if grandma's not going to make it, then it's not right. Uh, traditions may be, yeah, in our family, um, my father always writes a letter to the kids, and at Thanksgiving, he reads those aloud to the kids and tells them why he's thankful for each of the, the children in his life, and then he gives a letter to them. I don't know if you have traditions or not. Traditions in and of themselves are not horrible. However, traditions, when it comes to the subject that we're talking about today, is the reason why people veer off. They veer off because they're more interested in following their own desires. Thus, they teach their traditions as being equal to God's. Now, the question is then, when we get back to this model, not only which one is correct, but how did we get two different models? How did we reach a point where we have two different models? Because if we're just going to go off of the Bible, and I take you back to the interview on the day of Pentecost, when the guy came out of the water and the reporter said, which denomination do you belong to? That guy would have said, I don't know what you're talking about. But in America today, when you ask which denomination do you belong to, then we know exactly what we're talking about. That is because something down the road got off. And what's interesting is when you study church history, you'll come to find out that divisions came about because people became more powerful. And as they became more powerful and trustworthy, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It would have been maybe out of respect, but that person then arose to a position that God never intended that person to arise to. It would be like an elder here at this congregation that was smart, 
that was a godly man that was very spiritually minded, and congregations in the general area started relying upon him more than they kept their autonomy. That means their separateness and discussed it amongst their elders. They would say, well, let's go see what Brother So-and-so says at Washington Avenue. And then whatever Brother So-and-so said at Washington Avenue, that became the way it was. Now, I want you to imagine that one elder rising to power, and then I want you to come over here to another community and another elder rising to power, and over here to another community and that elder rising to power, and then all of a sudden within those elders that have arisen to power, there was one that was really smart, and he be kind of became the head of them all. You start to see a picture of church history because that was the beginning of the division. That was the beginning of tracing uh, people down or taking people down lines that would veer them off. And from that, I, I've done a study and you can see, you can do studies of various reasons why the religious groups in America came about. And what you're going to find is this, people split off of what they were a part of because they either didn't believe it was right or they wanted to change some of it. But in changing some of it, they didn't change all of it back to the Bible. Some people would say that when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg, Germany, that that was a good thing. I would say it was a good thing. But here's what I would also say. He had problems with the Catholic Church, and he wanted to reform the Catholic Church. The problem is we don't need to reform a denomination. We need to restore back to the original. And that's where Martin Luther got off. He only wanted to reform the Catholic Church. So guess what came out of Martin Luther's movement to reform the Catholic Church. It kind of sounds like his last name. Starts with an L and rhymes with Lutherism. Lutheranism. Have you ever seen a Lutheran church? That is a reformed version of the Catholic Church still carrying over much of the symbolism of the Catholic Church but in line with the reformations that Martin Luther wanted to make. All of that is in history. That's all documented. At the core, though, that's why we get back to this model. If I'm just going to discern according to the belief patterns that God would have me concern, I'm not going to use feminism. I'm not going to use atheism. I'm not going to use humanism. I'm not going to use materialism. And I'm not going to use denominationalism. The question then is this. Biblically speaking, which one of these models is correct? Model one or model two because they both can't be correct. And the reality is this. When Jesus said, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church, he didn't say it will have a bunch of denominations within it. That's just the truth. Now here's the deal. You all are going to be breaking up and going into classes. And in those classes you're going to have a chance to talk and have a chance to study individuals in the Bible that made mistakes and maybe successes when it came to discerning. You're going to study, if I'm not mistaken, Samson, uh, David, Peter and Paul, other things. I don't want to steal what Alan's going to tell you. But in all of that, what I want you to realize, and I don't want you to forget this model today. The model is you have a process to discern. Sometimes the worldview can be off. If the worldview is off, the discernment will be off. But sometimes the discerning process can actually be impacted by belief systems that are not in accordance with God's Word. So if I let denominationalism impact my discernment, then it will impact the way it filters, thus impacting my actions and my beliefs. Take that to your classes with you, the funnel concept. Remember, other things can impact it. Because what you're going to find out is this, there are people who know how to discern, but at times they choose not to discern wisely. That's a whole other subject. In other words, it would be like this, did David know that he shouldn't have taken Bathsheba the way that he did? And I don't want to steal the thunder, but the answer is yes. Did Eve know she wasn't supposed to eat the fruit? Yes, she did. So the question is this, why did they do it? I'm going to leave that to your teachers and for your discussion. Sometimes we can discern right but other things impact the actions and the beliefs. So let's end with a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it back over. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the start to this day, and we pray that as these young people now break up into their classes, I pray that you be with the teachers, the discussion leaders, and I pray these young people will be engaging in that because we're not here to waste time. 
I pray, Lord, that they would take advantage of what is before them today. Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for your word. And we pray that as we live and as we walk, that we would walk in a manner that is according to your word, filled with grace in the way that we deal with people, but also not bending on the truth of your word. Lord, help us. Help us to know that balance. Thank you for your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much.